What's up everybody? So in this video we're going to be talking about everything that you need to know regarding transport and no, this is not the kind of transport as in flying, running, taking a boat trip. It's not this kind of transport, unfortunately. This is the kind of transport where we learn about how things are transported in our body, how nutrients go where they need to go, how our oxygen goes where it needs to go. This kind of transport is what we're talking about. So this video will have two sections. We're going to first focus on transport within animals and then we're going to go on to talk about transport in plants, okay? So that's what we're going to be covering in this video. So let's just get started. So like I just said, we're going to be learning about transport, how things are moved around our body. Now, in our body, we have so many systems, right? Including our cardiovascular system, our respiratory system, our immune system, our digestive system, so many systems, and each of them have their own role. Now, the cardiovascular system is very important in this video because this system is responsible for moving everything where it needs to go inside our body, okay? So we can break the word down, cardiovascular system. Cardio refers to heart and vascular refers to our little vessels, all the pipes inside our body. And then inside these vessels, inside these pipes, we have blood, right? So red blood cells, white blood cells, nutrients, oxygen, carbon dioxide, many, many things dissolved in our blood. So the combination of these three things make up our cardiovascular system, which is responsible for transport. So I want you to understand now also that each of the systems in our body don't work in isolation. They depend on each other a little bit. So an example is our cardiovascular system depends on our other systems. For example, one you need to know about is our respiratory system. So when we open up here, uh, Eddie Hall, the world's strongest man, we look at his lungs and his heart and we see here, okay, so out here in our chest, we have the lungs. Uh, we have these pipes that lead to our lungs called our trachea and our bronchioles, right? We learn about that in the respiratory system video. And situated in between our two lungs, we have our heart. Normally, our heart is actually the shape of our fist, like a clenched fist. So this is obviously exaggerated unless you got a huge hand or something. Now, like I said, these two body systems work together. So how? Our respiratory system is going to be responsible for bringing air such as oxygen inside our body, inside our lungs, and then putting that air into our bloodstream, okay, into our bloodstream. Now, our cardiovascular system is going to help us distribute that blood, which contains nutrients and oxygen, to all the cells of our body. Because if we can keep our cells healthy and happy, then we will be alive. We will be healthy and happy. Okay. Now, it's important for us to understand how our cardiovascular system looks like. So let's go take a look at how it looks like. So let's say we have our heart here. How are all the vessels uh, linked to the heart and where are they all going? What's the whole circulation deal? So I'm going to show you a simplified diagram here of what you need to know about this circulatory system, okay? The cardiovascular system. So in the center here, we have our what? This is our heart. You're gonna, there's going to be a video where you guys learn a lot more details about the structure of the heart, the whole um, exact details of the circulation. For now, it's just to understand the overview because in this video, we're really going to focus more on the vessels. So we got our heart here and it's the pump. It's going to be the machine that's going to pump that blood across our body. So first, our heart is going to start and it's going to pump blood into this little vessel, this vessel here. Okay, We call that an artery, an artery. Specifically, we call it a large artery, okay, because they're attached to the heart and they're quite big. Now, the condition of our blood here is important to understand. So the blood here that is being pumped away from our heart um, in this scenario here will have a lot of oxygen. They're nice and fresh and it's got low carbon dioxide. Okay, so very important. This is the kind of blood our cells like. It likes to have a lot of oxygen because we know we need a lot of oxygen so we can do cell respiration and make ATP. And the same goes for low carbon dioxide. So this fresh blood is being pumped out of our large artery. And then we know these arteries will branch into smaller arteries. Okay, small arteries. And then they'll continue branching and branching till they become such small arteries. We call them arterioles. Arterial. So a small artery is just called an arterial. And then it gets branched so small that we reach a destination, which we call the even smallest little vessels called capillaries. Okay, so 
what we have here is our heart is pumping that, that fresh blood all over our body, our lower body, our upper body, any cells that you can think of that needs this blood, that needs this blood. So it's being sent large artery, small artery, arterial, and finally capillaries. These are such small vessels. Now, the capillaries are special because these um, are the vessels that are responsible for, um, these are the vessels where the nutrients and the oxygen can leave the bloodstream and go to our cells, right? So at the capillaries, we have a lot of cells that need the oxygen and nutrients and all that. So the capillaries is nice and specialized because they are the place where this blood can actually leave and go to the cells. Okay, that's important to understand. That's different from these large and small arteries. They are not allowed to let the blood leave. Only the capillaries are. So the capillaries allow this oxygen to leave and go to the cells and the cells can use them now for whatever they need to. And at the same time, the cells here can make waste like carbon dioxide and things like that. Now this waste is gonna be sent into the capillaries so that they can be taken back to the heart. So the blood coming out of here from the capillaries, we can consider waste blood because it's not fresh anymore. All the cells here drained this blood from the capillaries and used its nutrients and oxygen and now gave it back waste. So the waste is now coming back into this little vessel here, which we now call a venule. This is a small vein. And this small vein, the small venule, will drain into a bigger venules and bigger until we have the biggest veins, okay? So a venule is just a small kind of vein. So they drain out here. Now the blood here, important, is waste blood. So we can consider this kind of blood to be low in oxygen. Why? Because these cells here around the capillaries sucked out all of the oxygen from this vessel here, from the capillaries here, and gave back carbon dioxide because we know carbon dioxide is a waste product from cell respiration when we try and make ATP. So this blood here will now be the opposite. Low oxygen, high carbon dioxide. We don't want this in our body, okay? We don't want the high carbon dioxide in our body and we want, well, we want more oxygen, okay? So now it's coming back to the heart and now the heart cannot just take this blood and repeat the cycle. It can't just take it and pump it back because this blood is dirty. It's waste blood. If it sends it now to the cells, it'll be useless because there's no food, there's no nutrients, there's no oxygen in there, it'll be useless. So the heart first has to do something else that's very important. And that's why I keep emphasizing that our circulatory system is closely related to our pulmonary system or our lungs, our respiratory system. Because now this heart is gonna take this blood that is waste blood in a way, and it's gonna pump it out this vessel here towards our lungs, okay? Our, we consider this our pulmonary circulation, okay? And this right here is our systemic circulation. It's sent across our whole body, and this system is here just between our heart and our lung. So it takes this blood, and again, remember, what's the condition of this blood? It has low oxygen, high carbon dioxide, right? It came from here. It's taken by the heart. Now it's going to get pumped to the lungs. So first, it sends it out this artery, okay? And again, the arteries most close to the heart are considered large because they have to, they're one of these big branches coming off the heart. And they will branch and branch in, in the lung to smaller arteries. And then again, the smallest ones, the arterials. And then finally, what do we have here? Again, our capillaries. Now, what's special about the capillaries again? These are little vessels that allow these gases and nutrients to leave and um, to exit and enter. So here, what's going to happen is in our lung, in the capillaries, the uh, carbon dioxide is very high. So here at these capillaries, they're going to leave because we want to exhale them, right? We want to remove them from our body. So they're going to exit into our lungs, into our alveoli, and we're going to exhale them. And at the same time here, oxygen from the alveoli is going to enter, all right, because the capillaries are nice because things can exit and enter. So our high carbon dioxide is going to leave and oxygen is going to come in because our oxygen is very low. So that means now the blood draining out of this capillary will be what? We call it, the blood draining out will now have, give me a second, will have high oxygen and low carbon dioxide because we just entered oxygen and kicked out carbon dioxide. So now this blood is full of oxygen again, ready to go. Okay, but again, first, let's, let's come back here. The blood draining out, we're gonna call them venules. Okay, venule. And it's gonna drain into bigger, bigger veins and bigger veins and so on, and back to the heart. Okay, that's very important to understand. 
So we need, this is all a lot, I understand, but we need to now define what an artery is, what a vein is, because it looks like a mess, I agree. Okay, so let's, let's break down three key points you need to understand. The first one, the big brain tip uno, okay? Spanish for one, in case you didn't know, uno. So what are arteries? Arteries are these vessels, vessels, these pipes, that carry blood away from the heart. Veins are these vessels that carry blood towards the heart. I know that's not how you spell towards, but just understand that this helps you remember it. Okay, so very important. So let's look at this diagram again. Here, the blood was pumped away from the heart. So we call this vessel an artery, an artery. And then the blood coming back towards the heart in this vessel, we call this vessel a vein because it's going towards the heart. Now again here, this dirty blood was brought back to the heart. The heart is going to go send it to the lungs so the lungs can clean it up. We sends it out by this vessel, which is going, what, away from the heart. So we call it an artery. And then again, it gets cleaned up here in the lungs. It gets brought back now as fresh blood. This, this vessel coming back towards the heart, we call them what? A vein because it's going towards the heart. So that's big brain tip uno. So... Very important. Let's look at big brain tip two or dose. So understand this. What are the colors? So don't get confused by the colors. Red does not mean artery. It's only an artery if the blood is going away from the heart. So you can see here, although here it's red, although here it's blue, they're both arteries. Okay. So what is the deal with the color here? So the color here is represented by whether or not the blood is high in oxygen or not, whether the blood is fresh or not. So this blood here is fresh, right? It's got a lot of oxygen ready to give to all the cells. So because it's got a lot of oxygen, we're going to call, we're going to make this, we're going to annotate this artery as red. Okay, so therefore, it's red, oxygen rich. This one here is blue because there's no more oxygen. The oxygen is low. It has just been used by all the cells at the capillaries. Therefore, it's blue. Now, this heart is going to take this blue blood that's low in oxygen, pump it to the lungs. Because it's still low in oxygen, we make it blue. Okay, and then it gets cleaned up here by the capillaries where oxygen goes in and carbon dioxide comes out. And now it leaves and now it's fresh. Now, because it's fresh, it's high in oxygen. It is now red again. So know that these, the color is based on oxygen level. If oxygen level is high, the vessel will be red. If it's low, it will be blue. Okay, that's very important to understand. So don't get confused. This is our last tip here. Our big brain trip, tri oh, that's hard to say, big brain tip tress. The identification artery or vein is not based on the level of blood oxygenation, hence the color. It's not based on the color Okay, it's based on whether it's going away or towards the heart. Make sure you understand these big brain tips. And they're very important to understand. So I hope this makes sense. So this right here is our circulatory system, how it works. Okay, hope it makes sense. So now we're going to take a deeper dive and actually look at these vessels, the veins, the arteries and the capillaries, these three key kinds of vessels and look at their structure, how they're different, because it's very important to understand that. Oh yeah, by the way, so in, in like real life, if you really look at a, an artery, so the oxygen, right, is what makes the blood red. It's actually when oxygen goes into your blood, that makes the blood appear a bit red. So veins are never as bright red. They're really dark. They're not actually this blue. If you look at a real vein inside your body, it's just easier for students to understand the difference. But in reality, the real um, arteries and veins are more similar in color. The arteries will be very brighter red. They'll be much brighter red. And the vein will be much more dark. It won't be as bright, okay? But it won't be light blue like this, okay? Just make sure you understand that. But it's, don't worry about that. Okay, so now let's go and dive, take a deeper dive into these three kinds of vessels. Arteries, capillaries, and veins, okay? So here we have a nice zoom in of one of these little capillaries, okay? So you can see. So let's label some things. It's very important for us to first understand structure, and then we're gonna talk about function. If we understand the anatomy, how the things are working here, then we can look at the, func uh, the function. It will be much easier to understand. So again, simplified diagram here. We have our heart, it's pumping blood away from the heart. So what do we call that? An artery. Any vessel going away from our heart is an artery. A for away, yeah, V for towards. So it's going away. So we call this an artery. So let's label some things of this artery. So we can see here, there's a bunch of layers of cells, right? Remember, just like our whole body, our little vessels are also made up of cells. Our vessels aren't made of some other material. It's also made up of cells, just like our whole body. So remember that. 
So we can see here the most inner layer. We can see here these are like red blood cells, and there's a whole bunch of other things that I didn't put in here, but just remember this. There's inside here is going to be our blood. Now the you can see the most inner layer here. We can give a name. This is our endothelium. Okay, it's the very thin. It's one one layer thick. Okay, and its job we'll talk about in the next slide. Just want to give you the names of these structures. Then we got muscle. Look at this layer underneath the endoth endothelium. You can see it's a lot of layers. It can be very thick. In arteries, it's very thick. It can be many, many layers thick, depending on, on what kind of artery you look at. Like, for example, um, a big artery, a large artery, may be very, very thick. And an arterial may be a bit thinner, a slightly thinner. So depending on how big our arteries uh, will depend on how thick the uh, muscle layer is. But no, in arteries, compared to veins, it's very, very thick. Um, what else we got here? So inside here, this empty this space, the, the open space here that contains blood, we call that the lumen. So the open space here in the middle, the uh, the hollow part of the vein, of the artery, is called the lumen. And in an artery, it is relatively narrow because the muscle layer is so thick. Because it's so thick, the lumen has little has quite little space. So the lumen is very, relatively narrow. And we're going to talk about why that's useful later. And then lastly, we got this most outer layer. I don't want you to worry too much about it. I'm just going to put it here. Be aware of it. It's called the adventitia. And it's just a little layer um, made up of a relatively strong material. We can call it collagen. But don't worry about it too much. Okay, It's not that important for you guys to worry about. I want you to really worry about the muscle layer being very, very thick in the arteries. That's a very key thing to understand. And also know that this muscle layer um, and other parts of this of this artery contains a bunch of elastic tissue, very stretchy tissue. And we're going to talk about that as well. And it's very thick in arteries. So I want you to, the key thing I want you to take away from arteries is that they have a very thick muscular layer, a uh, very narrow lumen, and also a lot of elastic layers um, distributed inside the vessel, uh, um, in the vessel wall, okay, everywhere. Now let's go to veins, I mean capillaries. So the arteries are now, um, the blood is now sent through the arteries to the capillaries where we know all the all the magic can happen. All the nutrients can leave and all the waste can enter here. Okay, that, That's what makes these capillaries so special. So a bunch of capillaries like this together, a group of capillaries like this, is called the capillary bed. Who knows why it's called a bed? Just under, just memorize that. Don't know why, who, who made that up, but it's just called capillary bed this area here. And here we zoomed into one capillary, so it's clear to see. You can see its capillary is so small, it's made up of one cell layer compared to the artery, which has so many cells, so many layers, way thicker. Capillary is really, really small, and there's barely enough space for a single cell, a white red blood cell, okay? So it's basically made of one layer, endothelium, okay? Okay, now we know the blood is going to drain out of the capillary bed. This might be a bit of waste blood, right? The nutrients have been sucked out by all the cells around here. And now we have the veins. So what's different about the veins compared to the arteries? So first of all, their purpose, right? They're coming back towards the heart. Now let's label some stuff. Let's start off here with the inner layer. The inner layer here is the same. It's an endothelium. We're going to talk about the function later. Also one layer thick. Then we've got muscle. But I want you to notice now the muscle layer compared to the artery is much thinner. Okay, it's much thinner. It's not as thick at all. And therefore, the lumen, the empty space inside, is bigger than the artery. The artery is lumen. It does not that clear on this image that I give you here. But the lumen in the artery is relatively small because the wall is so thick. In a vein is the opposite. Because the wall or the muscle layers are relatively thin, the lumen is quite big. Okay, it's quite big. Um, also, remember, because the muscle layer is thinner, there is also a less elastic layers. Remember, the muscles, the elastic layers are distributed here inside the muscle and other places of the artery wall. There is less of those elastic layers in the veins and less muscle. Okay, so it's thinner. And lastly, we also got this last outer layer, again, the adventitia. Just for strength, don't worry about it too much. I want you to just understand from veins that they are thinner, the walls are thinner. And then last important thing I want you to understand from veins is that they have these little structures here, which we're going to talk more about in this video. They are called valves. V for valves. The veins have valves. So remember that. The veins have valves. Not the arteries or the capillaries, just the veins. They love to ask this in multiple choice. Okay, so here now we outline the, all these structures that you need to know how to label um, about arteries, capillaries, and veins, all the three kinds of vessels in our body, the transport vessels. 
now we're going to look at the function, okay? The function is going to have quite a few things, but I hope it makes sense. I hope it's clear enough. Let's get into it. So let's first start with our arteries, okay? Arteries. Again, purpose of arteries. I already said this, but I'm going to show it here for you guys because I know you guys like to have the words written out as well, not other than me just saying it for you guys. So arteries, they take blood to the capillary bed away from the heart, okay? I can show you again. From the heart, it's pumped away, that's why it's called arteries, towards the capillary bed, okay? Where the cells are that need it. Okay, what next? So arteries, I just said, are very thick, thicker compared to veins. Why is that? Think about it. The artery is receiving blood from the heart. The heart is a pumping machine. It's gonna generate so much pressure by forcing the blood out of the heart into these arteries it's going to be a lot of stress on the on the artery. There's going to be so much um, blood in here at once um, causing pressure. So if these arteries are very thin and weak like veins, they might burst. So it's very important for the arteries to be thicker so that they can withstand more pressure as the heart is pumping all that blood into the artery. Okay, that's important to understand. That's one reason why the arteries are so thick in terms of muscle and elastic layers. Okay. Okay, endothelium, the most inner layer I just mentioned here, the endothelium, what is its purpose? Uh, really, all you need to know is that it's like a slippery little layer of cells. So it reduces friction. When the heart pumps that blood into the artery, that little layer is nice and slippery, allowing the, the, the blood to just flow right by instead of, being really f uh, instead of being stopped by all the friction. Okay, muscle. Remember, for arteries, it is very thick. Take that away. It's very thick. Okay, why does that matter? First of all, um, for contraction. So you know, me and you, we got muscle on our biceps, we got biceps, we got triceps, we got glutes, we got all these muscles that we can control with our brain. When I want to punch someone or I want to pick something up, I can just think it and it will happen, right? So unlike those skeletal muscles that we have on our biceps and triceps, there there is also muscle in our little vessels, these little muscles here. But the thing is, it is not controlled by you. It's not voluntarily controlled by you. It is controlled by your autonomic nervous system. This system is out of your control. So these can contract, but you have no idea when to contract them. You can't cause them to contract. Your body will be in charge of that. Okay, so it's controlled by your autonomic nervous system. So it can contract, and we'll see why that's useful. Like, why on earth would we want the arteries to contract? Why? We're going to see that now on the next diagram. I'm going to show you. So... Um, other than other than being able to contract, because it's so thick, it provides strength. And that's very important. Why? Because remember, the arteries have to withstand a lot of pressure as the heart um, forces a lot of blood into there. So when it can, because it's very thick, it can withstand a lot of that pressure. Okay, now let's look at a little diagram that's going to help us. Uh, wait, before we do that, I want to reveal this last one. So remember how I said that we also have a lot of elastic layers distributed in our wall, in between our muscles or other places. So they're very important because think about it. Elastic means it can stretch, okay? And when things can stretch, it means they can return back to normal, like a rubber band. When you pull a rubber band, it's stretchy, but when you let go, it's gonna recoil back to its original shape. So because our artery has a lot of these elastic layers, it can also stretch and recoil. Why is that important? So these two, the muscle and the elastic layers, have one kind of joint function. Let me show you. So imagine, imagine this. Imagine your arteries were very stiff. They had no elasticity. So this is not what it's actually like. But if you understand this scenario, then you understand why it's important that there's elasticity. So imagine there was no elasticity. It was stiff. And your heart pumped blood. Because these walls are rock solid, the blood will be really, really fast and flowing really, really hard here and then slow down and slow down until it's not flowing anymore, right? You can think about that. Imagine you have, um, you blow water into a pipe or you blow air into the pipe. Initially, the pressure is so high and it's moving very fast and then as it goes further and further, it stops flowing until it stops flowing at all, right? This is what's going to happen if you have no elasticity in your walls. When it's rigid, you're not going to be able to have continuous blood flow all the time. And that means um, this is not what it's really like. So what's it really like? Because our arteries actually have a lot of these elastic layers, when the heart pumps and forces a lot of blood in, our walls, our arteries' walls can expand a bit, stretch a bit, accompanying more blood. And because they can stretch a bit, what does that mean? Like a rubber band, they can recoil. They can recoil. So what's going to happen is initially they will stretch out and then they will recoil 
along with the contraction of your muscles because you also have muscles there. So not only does the elastic layers recoil back to normal, but the muscles out of not out of our control, remember the autonomic nervous system controls them, they will contract along with the recoil of the of the elasticness. They will recoil back and kind of squeeze that blood further along. So because they recoil back, now they force all this blood in here to move along. Okay, so that's very important. So this elasticity helps the blood to continuously flow along, unlike how it would be if it was stiff. So the blood comes in high pressure, the recoil and the contraction of the muscle squeezes the blood all along. And this continues to happen all along the artery until the end. So this way, the blood flow is continuous. It's not like um, a lot of blood and then nothing. A lot of blood and then nothing. It's continuous. The blood is uh, here and then it gets squeezed all along so it reaches the end. So that's very important. Our elastic fibers and this muscle is very important for allow allowing continuous flow. Okay? All throughout the vessel. Okay. So here we have, sorry. Here we have the word form of that. So you can read that if you want to. So just understand that is the role of our arteries. Okay? For stretch and recoil, that's very important in contraction. Okay? Very important. Our arteries have that. Otherwise, it'd be a hell of a story. Okay, last one, remember the lumen is very small. Uh, that's very important because if it's a very small lumen, that means there's a lot of pressure. When there's a lot of pressure like that inside the lumen, then the blood will move very fast through it, right? Because it's because the blood behind it will press on it and allow it to move forward. So when we have a very small lumen, the blood will move very fast because there's no space, but no space to go except forward, okay? If the lumen's very big, the blood has a lot of space to go to, okay? But it's very small, the blood has nowhere to go except forward. So the flow is maintained. So a small lumen is very important because it maintains the flow so that the blood can go all the way from our heart down to the smallest arterioles. Okay, otherwise it would be very difficult for the blood to continue all the way along till the end if the lumen was very big. Okay, and last one, adventitia, don't worry about it, it's just for strength. So let's go to capillaries. I like capillaries, most simple to understand. So our capillaries, like I said, is the site of nutrient exchange, where all the good things leave the capillary and go to the cells, and all the bad things go from the cells into the capillaries to be taken away by the veins. So what's special about them is that they are very, very thin, like I showed you, right? They're like one cell thick, one cell thick. That means that the, that the nutrients and things can very easily wiggle, waggle through the cells and reach the outside area where all the cells are. Okay, so they're very thin and permeable. Permeable me just means things can easily pass through it. Okay. Um, there are special places in our body, like our kidney and our intestines, where the capillaries are even extra permeable, like more permeable than normal, because the intestines, you want all the nutrients to go into the capillaries, and the kidney, you want all the waste to be filtered out. So these capillaries are even more permeable, so that all these nutrients can come in in the intestine, and the kidney can filter out all the waste very easily. So these are places where the capillaries are what we call fenestrated, so even more permeable. It just means they have a lot of little holes in them, um, compared to normal capillaries that are not that permeable. Okay, remember, capillaries are everywhere. So when you look at, um, let's go back here, to all the branching, the capillaries have so many branches, so many branches compared to a venule. Look, a venule has like some branches, but capillaries have a really huge network of branches. This is done so that they can reach all the cells in our body, right? Because we have so many cells and the capillaries need to supply all of them. So know that our capillaries, what's unique about them is that they are very highly branched compared to the arteries and the veins. Okay. Endothelium, same thing, reduced friction. Lumen, very small. Um, uh, very, very, it's very, very small, as you saw, like literally one cell can fit in there. And that's very important because, because this allows um, the capillary bed to have time for nutrient exchange to happen. Because the flow, remember, the flow is really fast in the arteries and then over time when it reaches the capillary bed, the lumen is so small and there's almost no space that the flow slows down quite a bit, quite a lot. It moves very slow at this point in the capillaries. But this is important because this gives us time for the nutrients to leave and ways to enter. If the blood just flowed by like zoom, zoom, there'd be no time for nutrients to enter and waste to leave. I mean, nutrients to exit into the cells and waste to enter the capillaries. There'd be no time for that. So it's very important that the lumen is very, very small and that the flow is very, very slow. It gives time for things to happen. Otherwise, there'd be no time for that. 
Okay, so here we have the diagram. Blood comes in, fresh and oxygenated comes in, and see, because it's so thin, nutrients can leave to the cells and waste can enter and waste can be taken away. So because the flow is very, very slow here, that gives time for this to be able to happen. If the flow is very fast, like in the arteries, there'd be no time for that. You gotta give time for the job to be done. So let's now go to the veins. So veins take blood away from the capillary bed towards the heart, so the opposite of the arteries. They are thinner, remember, because they are so far away from the heart. Once you understand, blood has to be pumped from the heart and be, and then the uh, all the way through the arteries and then the capillaries. So the, by the time they reach the veins, remember, the blood flow is really, really slow in the capillaries. So that, so that nutrient exchange can happen. So the blood entering the veins are moving really, really slow. So because they're moving really, really slow, there's no point in the vein having a very, very thick wall. It doesn't have to withstand any pressure. There's no need for that. We'd rather have the vein have a very big lumen so that a lot of blood can be carried back towards the heart. So the veins, uh, they are very thin, okay, because they don't need to withstand all this high pressure. Okay, the endothelium again, reduce friction. So the muscle, make sure you both these at the same time. The muscle is very, very thin because it doesn't need to contract so much um, compared to the arteries and they don't need to be as thick and strong because of the low pressure. Um, they also have less elastic layers, so less stretch and less recoil compared to the elastic uh, compared to the arteries elastic layers. Okay, that just makes sense because there's no um, uh, rush for the blood to go back. Okay, lumen opposite from the arteries is very large, um, unlike the arteries that's very small. Now the last unique thing, remember, is valves. So veins have valves. I'm going to show you a diagram now. Here. So valves are little things here inside the veins, okay? They are little one-way doors, one-way doors, meaning blood can only pass one way through them, okay? The valve can only open one day, one way. So for example, if we have the vein here and the blood is traveling upwards, blood can travel through it because this vein, this valve opens this way. But if blood wants to come downwards, the valve's shut closed. Think about it. Imagine the blood's flowing down. The blood is going to force these valves to shut closed. So the blood cannot flow backwards. So the veins, uh, the valves in the veins are very important to ensure one-way flow. Why is that important? Remember, I just told you that the blood flow in veins is very slow. Because think about it. It's coming from the capillaries that the blood flow is flowing like one cell at a time. So the veins blood flow is so slow that you need the valves. Otherwise, the blood will just keep dropping back to the bottom. Okay, so because the blood flow is so slow, the blood isn't being forced upwards, the blood can easily fall, fall backwards and back into the capillary bed if there's no vein, if, if there's no valves. So the valves are very important to ensure that the blood goes back to the heart eventually and doesn't keep falling back due to gravity because the blood flow is so slow. So this brings us to another point of muscles. Uh, uh, one very key thing for our muscles you know, our muscles are very useful because they can make us move and do things, running, jumping, whatever. But another interesting thing our muscles are useful for is here. If you have a vein here that has valves and your muscles are relaxed, the veins are not being compressed, right? And remember, the veins have very thin walls, so they're very easily compressed compared, uh, compared to arteries. Arteries are very thick, so to compress them, it's very difficult. It's, it, they're too strong, but veins can be very easily compressed. So when your muscles are relaxed around the vein, um, uh, the, what's going to happen is the blood will just stay the way it is, okay? Obviously, the valves are preventing blood from flowing downwards, back down, right? That's very important because we don't want the blood to go down. We want it to go back to the heart. But when your muscles contract, they squeeze these veins. And remember, the veins are very weak, very thin, so they're very easily compressible. But when you compress them, now you're going to try and force some blood up and some blood down. But thankfully, because of the valves, the, as soon as the blood tries to move down, the valves prevent them and they can't move down. So the blood is ultimately forced to go up. So by moving your muscles and contracting your muscles, you actually help your veins to move the bl blood back up to your brain, back up to, I mean, back up to your heart. So that's very important. That's why exercise is very important. When you sit on a plane for a long time and you're not doing any movement, your blood kind of stagnates in your legs and causes swelling and all that. But when you move around in the plane, you contract and help your veins to move the blood back up to your heart and you reduce the swelling. So that's very important. So in general, in general, physical activity is very important for this reason. You can't just sit down all day, okay? Because you're going to get a lot of swelling and have a... When, when, blood, when blood ends up being very still in one place for a long time, they can very easily form blood clots. So you can get strokes and heart attacks and all that. So exercise to move 
this blood constantly around and back up prevents them from stagnating and causing like strokes and heart attacks and blood clots from forming. So that's very important. Okay, that's it. And the last one, adventitia, which is for strength. So that's very important. We covered the hardest stuff just now in this video already. Okay, so we got these three vessels. We know their structure. We know their function. Make sure you know their differences, their similarities. Very important. Uh, here, I want to show you a real picture. So this is like if we take a real real slice from our body and we look, we can see here th the three um, vessels. The big thick one, look at the thick wall. That's an artery, very thick muscular layer, the endothelium, the adventitia, elastic layers in, in there that helps it to stretch a little bit. You can see it's very thick and inside there there's blood cells and all that sort of stuff. This is the lumen that has some blood cells in it. So you can see this is the artery because it's very thick. This is the vein because look how thin the wall is so so thin with a huge lumen so i think this image is really great because it really shows you the real scenario in our body thick walls for the arteries lumen um the vein um very um very big lumen very weak you can see how fragile and weak it is it's very thin the wall okay um and the capillary really really small one cell layer thick you can't barely even see it with the lumen inside that's very tiny so this image is really useful to see the real scenario and you can see all the tissue around it um, just around our, around in our body. Okay, here's a little summary. These are just very important. These are not all the things that you that um, this you shouldn't only remember this table. Like I said, on here, there's a lot of little details you should know if you want to get the top grade. Um, these are these here are some of the most key things. So if you have no time, remember these. But if you want a really good grade, obviously focus on all the things that I mentioned. But here's a nice summary of some differences between the arteries, the veins, capillaries. Okay, next we're going to the second last part, measuring pulse rate. This is, this is pretty straightforward, so let's go quickly on this. So your pulse rate is the number of times your heart beats per minute. So athletes, for example, will have a very low pulse rate. They don't need to, uh, their heart doesn't need to beat that much because they're so fit. They don't need that much blood and nutrients and oxygen because they're so fit. They can um, kind of do a lot with so little. Okay, so two places where you can measure your pulse rate is uh, radial artery and your carotid artery. So your radial artery is basically, if you, you can feel this artery on the thumb side of the wrist with the palm facing up two centimeters from the base of the thumb. So just go feel your wrist near the thumb side of your wrist, um, two centimeters from the base of your thumb. If you feel there, you can move around a little bit if you can't feel it. So not everyone's is exactly on the same place. And then after a while, you might feel it doof, doof, doof. If it's beating very fast, uh, you're either very nervous and seeing some lady in front of you, or uh, you're just very unfit, okay? Here's a carotid artery. This one is, they like to use this in the movies because it's very big and easy to find. Um, it's on your neck, on the side of your neck. It's very big, so it pumps quite hard compared to the radi radial artery. You can just feel around for that next to your trachea. Now, how do we measure pulse rate? Very important to understand. I'm going to read this here because I wrote it specifically so it's clearly to understand. So first, you feel for your pulse. Once the pulse is felt, then start a timer for 60 seconds. During these 60 seconds, count the number of pulses. So if you count 80 beats in that, in that 60 seconds, your heart rate is 80 beats per minute, okay? But sometimes you don't have the time to wait a whole minute. So what you can do is you can do it for 30 seconds and then multiply your pulse number by two. So let's say you feel for 30 seconds and you counted 40 beats, okay? So now you can just double that to find out how much it would be in one minute, that that be 80 beats, okay? So that's how you measure your pulse rate, very important. It's a very good way of figuring out if someone is dead. Because if there be no pulse rate, if there's no pulse, that means uh, no blood is going to their brain, to their organs, and so their cells are going to die soon. So you need to save them, CPR. Okay, last part here, coronary arteries. So you need to know about a kind of specific artery that is actually on our heart. This artery is, so your heart will pump the blood into this little artery, away from the heart, but onto the heart. Isn't that interesting? So this is the, because you might wonder, okay, the heart is pumping blood to the whole body so that the whole body can get fresh nutrients and oxygen to survive. But how does the heart survive? That's very interesting. These coronary arteries are little arteries that are supplying the heart itself. So the heart, not only does it pump blood to the whole body, it also pumps blood to itself by the coronary arteries, these little arteries. So these are arteries that supply the blood to the cardiac muscle because the heart is just a big, big muscle that is not controlled by yourself, right? It's, you don't, you don't decide how many times you, uh, how often you beat your heart, right? It's controlled by your autonomic nervous system. It's not controlled by you. So this blood will go to the heart itself and keep it healthy and all that. Now, 
normally these coronary arteries will be nice and empty i mean not nice and empty but nice and round just have blood inside them but sometimes you can have a problem where you have an occluded artery so a little plaque something some things called plaque will build up plaque is like little fat and um fat fat things and other um, fibrin and things like that that build up because of bad habits like smoking and eating a lot of fat things and a lot of lot of things contribute. We'll look at it now. But when these are occlude, when these arteries get so occluded that blood can barely flow past them, then that's going to lead to your heart dying, right? Because imagine, imagine this little area gets occluded. Now blood can't because here blood can flow very easily, nice and freely, supplying the heart. But it gets if it gets occluded like this, there's a very limited space for blood to flow past. So this area is not receiving enough oxygen and it's going to start dying. So we call this coronary heart disease or in simple terms, a heart attack. When you have a heart attack, it just means your heart is not receiving enough blood because there's some occlusion or something going on, preventing the blood from reaching the heart. And that area is going to die off. And when that area dies off, that's a problem because now your heart, a part of your heart is dead and your heart is supposed to pump blood to the rest of your body. So if your heart is not working, then the rest of your body is also going to be missing blood now and start dying. So you might pass out or whatever, you might die, right? If you don't solve the problem quick enough. So that's what you need to know. So here are some factors that can be correlated with a coronary heart disease, will correlate with this problem. Sometimes sex can, sex can influence it, like as in whether you're male or female. Age can influence it, like obviously older people are more likely to have coronary heart disease because of their bad habits since, a, since, since when they're young. Um, family history, maybe it's in your genetics, maybe your diet will affect it if you don't eat healthy foods, maybe if you have diabetes, hypertension, So what I, or smoking is very important. So what I want to say is that there's not one single thing that causes coronary heart disease or this plaque buildup inside your coronary arteries. It is a combination of many things. So we call it a multifactorial disease. So you have to take care of yourself in terms of everything. Obviously, you cannot control your sex, your age, your family history, but you can control the other things. So make sure you control what is possible to control. The rest is not up to you, right? Okay, so that's it. We covered a lot. And now we're going to do some questions um, and then we'll move on to the uh plant part okay the plant part which is much shorter so question one here what helps to keep blood flowing onwards away from the heart in an artery away from the heart it's going to be arteries we know arteries so what about arteries allows blood to continue flowing away right we learned that we learned that arteries do not have valves so it's not going to be a they do have a lot of elastic fibers and this these elastic fibers remember if we come back to it here these elastic fibers is what allows the blood to continuously move all the way down. The, the elastic fibers and the muscles contracting. Okay? Uh, contraction of skeletal muscles. No, they don't help uh, blood move away, but they do help blood return to the heart um, by compressing the, the veins, right? We learned that here. The veins can be compressed. The veins can be compressed by skeletal muscles helping blood return to the heart, but it's not like that for the arteries. Okay. Having a wide lumen. The artery does not have a wide lumen. It has a narrow lumen. A narrow lumen helps to help blood flow away from the heart, right? Because a narrow lumen makes the blood flow faster because there's no space to go except forward. Okay, so the answer here is going to be B. What is the role of coronary arteries? We just learned this one. To supply information about blood temperature to the hypothalamus. No, it does not do that. That would be some kind of nerve. Um, to supply the heart muscle with oxygen and nutrients. Yes, it's going to be that one. To carry blood away from the heart. Um, no, it carries blood towards the heart itself so that the heart can be supplied. To monitor blood pH. Nope, it's definitely B. Which blood vessels have thick muscular walls that can resist pressure and assist in pumping blood? Arteries, right? They have very thick so they can resist the high pressure from the blood coming from the heart and they can assist in pumping blood because the, the elastic layers can recoil and the muscle, the smooth muscles in the vessel can contract to help squeeze it along along the vessel all the way down. So the answer is going to be arteries. So atria is a is a chamber of the heart, which you'll learn about later. The veins do not help move how that do not help pumping blood and they can't resist high pressure because they're very thin. And ventricles is another chamber of the heart which you'll learn about. So the answer is going to be A. Oops. Oh something's happening. Okay, let me just fix that for you. Somehow I didn't prepare that. Hey, okay. 
Last one. What is the similarity between arteries and capillaries? Um, the answer here is going to be neither has valves. Remember, the only one that has valves is your veins. Okay, so that's very important to understand. Very key difference. So here, lastly, I want to show you a big question. Um, this is from the old syllabus because obviously there has been no new exam on the new syllabus. So do this question with regards to all the information you learned in this video. Develop yourself a nice answer and make sure you can answer this kind of question on a test. This is one very key question they can ask because it's largely what we learn in this chapter. Here is the mark scheme from the previous syllabus. There's like 90% overlap. So it is very, very similar. So you can use this mark scheme to guide you. But no, it's from the old syllabus. So it's not exactly the same. So you might have to modify your answer a little bit. So just like animals, plants also have their own ways of transporting things from where to where they need to go. They have their own little vessels, their own little pipes that make sure everything goes where it needs to go. But it's a little bit different from, from, from animals, right? And let me show you. I think the best way to explain this, we're going to tell a story of this little guy here, our water, which is in the root all the way from the root up to the leaf, okay? And then as we go along, we'll explain all the little structures and it should make sense. And everything you need to know will be there. So let's start off here in the root. And bear in mind, I'm talking specifically about plants called dicotyledon plants. We can split up all the plants into two categories, dicotyledon and monocotyledon. We're only focusing on the dicotyledon plants, okay? Because that's what you need to know for the IB. So don't get confused when you see this word. Just know you are learning about dicotyledon plants. So now we're in the root here and we know the, 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 the roots here are anchored into the soil, right? Why? Because the roots is the thing that's going to absorb minerals and water into the root, right? So how does the root look like? Our root has looks vaguely like this. And let's reveal some structures. We got the outer layer here, the epidermis, okay? And then we've got the cortex, which is this whole thick green part. And then in the center, I mean, the little layer here surrounding the center is going to be our endodermis. And then in the endodermis, we got two key vessels. So this is where the real vessels are, the pipes. Like in the humans, the arteries and the veins, these are the vessels in the plants. Okay, and we're going to call them xylem and phloem. I like to remember it as in the xylem here is in the center and it looks like an X a little bit, right? The xylem. Okay, and then the outer part here, we've got the phloem. Now the phloem, I remember it as P for periphery. So the phloem is always on the outside and you'll see it's the same when we look at the stem. Okay, so now the xylem, the function of the xylem, and don't worry, all these words I'm saying, I have a little table later where I have all the structures and a sentence describing them. So don't worry if you can't catch everything. Now the xylem is the structure that's actually responsible for moving the water. Okay, it's the pipe that water is transported in. So if we have a little water here that comes into root, in actuality, it's entering the xylem. Now the xylem will move that water up, up to the stem and then up to the leaf. Okay, so know that the xylem is where the water and the minerals are being transported. The phloem is another pipe and it's transporting carbohydrates like sucrose, kind of like uh, sucrose that, that plants need for energy and things like that. So it is transporting something slightly different from the xylem. Okay, now the epidermis, this layer here on the outside, What's unique about it, it is the layer where water has to pass. So sometimes the epidermis can grow little hairs, like little hands, that basically help absorb the water. Okay, so the root can have a little, bunch of little hairs on it that help absorbing water even better. Okay, so it, like a bunch of little hands grabbing the water and pulling it in. Okay, the cortex is mainly for structure. It doesn't have like a specific key function. It's not very specialized. It can also store certain things, certain nutrients but it doesn't have any huge role, okay? So again, the combination between the xylem and the phloem, we call that our vascular bundle. So here is a realistic image that you need to be able to recognize. Again, you can compare and see it's very, very similar, our cortex, our epidermis, endodermis, the xylem and the phloem. Make sure we can recognize both because you may need to be able to draw a cartoony version of a, a of a root structure, a cross section like this, or even they may give you a one and you need to label it. So be make sure you can do, you can recognize this very well. So now the water comes and it's been moving up in the stem um, to the top. So what's interesting here? How does water just move up? Because in, in the animals, we know we have a heart and the heart is the thing that's going to pump, pump the, the blood everywhere through our vessels. But uh, does a plant have a heart? No, it has no heart. So 
what is causing the water to move upwards against gravity. We call that process capillary action, and we're going to look at it later in detail, okay? So now we have the water coming up to the stem. How does the stem look like? So we cut the stem. Let's take a look at it. You can see it's a bit more complicated. Let's reveal things. So there's some structures here that you need to know. Let me show you. Uh, first of all, here, the brown part, that's the xylem. And then the blue, blue one here is our phloem. See, again, the xylem is more towards the center. That's how I like to remember it. Okay, and the P uh, for the phloem is near the periphery. It's more near the outside. And again, the combination of these two, our phloem and our xylem, we call the vascular bundle. Now, what's similar? We also got the epidermis, just like we did in the root. Um, then we got the center part, the stick center part called the pith. I crossed it out here because you don't need to know it. I'm just labeling it here because when you see a real image, that structure will be there. And I don't want you to be like, what's that? Do I need to know that? Okay, just labeling everything for you guys. And then what's this black thing here? Because we got the xylem, the phloem, and this black thing. Uh, this black thing is called the pericycle, and you don't need to know it, but you're going to see it on the realistic image, so I don't want you to get lost when you see that, okay? You don't need to know what it does, though. It's there um, next to the phloem. Then we got this cortex here, so that's similar to this the, the root here that also has a cortex. And then we have this white line in between the xylem and the phloem. You also don't need to know what that is. It's called the vascular cambium, and it's basically a little area that stimulates the xylem and the phloem to grow properly. So know the things that are not crossed out here, okay? Know the things that are not crossed out. And the xylem has the same function in the stem that it has in the root, carrying water up, water and minerals upwards from the root. And the phloem has the same function as in the root, carrying sucrose and things like that in the plants, okay, for energy. So here, let's look at a realistic image. So see, they have this little black structure here. So if you saw that and you didn't know what it was, you might be like, wait, is that the phloem now? Because it's the, you might get confused. So don't get confused. It will look like this on the real image. So we can compare center here, the pith. We got the epidermis. We got the pericycle. Don't need to know it though. The phloem and then the xylem. Okay, so make sure, and then the cortex. So make sure you can recognize, again, the same way as the root. Make sure you can recognize it, label a diagram if you're given one, or draw a very vague diagram. Now, because it's the IB I saw in the book, they completely ignore the pericycle. So sometimes you may be given an image where there is no pericycle. It was deleted. So in that case, when you only see, when you see a picture of two regions like this, one here, one here, with no third region, just know that the most outer part is then the phloem, and that's the xylem. That means they ignored the pericycle. So just that's a heads up for you guys. Okay, so now our water is moving up. We got no know what the root looks like. We know now what the stem looks like. So it moves now up to the leaf. Let's take a look at the leaf structure. Oh yeah, first, Maybe many of you will want to know, okay, how the heck does the structure change from the root to the stem in a split second like that? How does that happen? So it's kind of interesting. You don't need to know it, but I want to show you it. Just it's cool to look at. So in the root, the vascular bundle in the center is like this. And as the stem starts forming, branches start forming from this vascular bundle to the outside of the pipe to the outside of the stem. That's why it ends up looking like this, having a bunch of vascular bundles distributed near the periphery. Okay, so again, don't need to know it. Just be aware of this concept. I think it's pretty interesting. Okay, it may help you remember the idea a bit better of the root and the stem. So here is the table I promised you guys, all the structures and their functions. Remember, it's for dicotyledon plants, not monocotyledon plants. And then here we got the stem. So remember, xylem, transporting water and minerals up from the roots, but it can also serve as mechanical support in the stem. So it can have two functions, bear that in mind. Not only moves water and minerals, but it happens to be pretty sturdy and strong, and that helps the stem, prevents it from collapsing or falling over. Okay? Awesome. So now, finally, like I said, we're at the leaf. Okay? The leaf structure was covered in another chapter called Gas Exchange. Um, where we talk about gas exchange in plants. So I'm not going to go into detail here. I'm just going to show you the structure. You don't need to be able to label this kind of structure for this specific chapter. You do need to label it for another chapter called gas exchange. But right now it's going to be useful in explaining transport in plants. So we're still going to use it. But don't. this is not the emphasis of this uh, chapter. So here comes the water. It's being transported in what? The xylem. So here is our xylem here. You can see 
Here's our vascular bundle of the xylem and the phloem. The water comes out. It will leave into these empty spaces in the layer called the spongy mesophyll. So understand this image. The top here is the top of the, the leaf, and the bottom here is the bottom of the leaf. So the water will go in, go to certain cells that need it because it's got minerals and water, and all the cells need that. And eventually, it can be sweated out. Yeah, just like in humans, right? In humans, we get rid of water through sweat right? We call that sweating. But in plants, we call sweating transpiration. So when plants get rid of get rid of water out of the leaf, we call that transpiration, which is the equivalent to sweating in humans. So where does it exactly get sweat out of? Here, these little holes called stoma. So there are certain in the epidermis at the bottom of the leaf, we got um, little cells here called guard cells, and they can control how big this hole is. If they decide to, if they want this hole smaller, they can make their, themselves bigger and therefore make the hole smaller. If they want the hole bigger, they can make themselves smaller to make the hole bigger. We call this hole the stoma. So this is where sweating or evaporation of water can happen from. It can leave right out there into the environment. Okay. So I want to give you another view of that here. So if we look now, not from the side, because this image here is a cross section. It's a side view of the plant, right? We're looking at from the side. I want to give you now a bottom view. So you look at the leaf from the bottom, we can see a bunch of these little holes, these stomas everywhere. So let me show you one area where the hole exists. So here is... Okay, great. Here. So you can see here, if we look at the bottom, the stoma is this little hole here, and the surrounding two cells, these cells, the guard cells, can move and change their shape to increase or decrease the size of the stoma and therefore influence the rate of sweating or transpiration in plants. Okay, and then all the cells surrounding that are not um, um, that are not guard cells here are called epidermal cells. Okay, just these here. Okay, so great. So make sure you can recognize both the side view and the bottom view. It's very important. So ultimately, we had this little water come from the root, move up by capillary action to the stem and then to the leaf and then leave the leaf by um, through the stoma by transpiration. Okay, that's awesome. So now we know how um, water and, and things are moved all around the plant in these little vessels. We also we know that for plants and we also know that for animals. You can see how they are very different. So now we real quick got to look at the xylem structure, okay, xylem structure. So the xylem, you um, before it's formed, it's actually a bunch of living cells stacked on top of each other like this. To form the xylem, these cells end up dying and merging together. So let me show you. They die, and now they are the, the membranes aren't there anymore separating them. So now they're one long pipe, you see? So let's look at some features. So the xylem, when it's formed, it's just dead cells, dead cells, not living. And they have these little holes in them, which allow the water and things to move in and out um, very easily. Otherwise, the water will be confined to the xylem and can't go to the cells. So the pits are very useful to allow water to move out of the xylem. Not only that, the walls here have a material in them called lignin, which helps keep them strong. Okay, need to know that. So that, that's why the xylem can also serve a structural role to keep the stem very strong. Now notice the, here the walls are absent to make a pipe-like thing, right? Very important. And water will move upwards from the roots to the top of the plant. So one key big brain tip, quattro, for this video, which means four, is xylem is the dead leftover walls of cell, while the phloem, which is the other kind of pipe, which carries sucrose, is living okay that's one key difference between the xylem and the phloem so know the structure of the xylem and these key points about the xylem now remember that the the plant does not have a heart so the process by which water moves from the root up into the stem up to the top of the plant we call that capillary action this is a concept that is explained in a 1.1 so i'm not going to give detail on it essentially water is absorbed um, into this, the, the stem and the root due to that creates negative pressure. The negative pressure causes the water to move up due to its properties of cohesion and adhesion um, and so on. Okay, so the process is a little complex. If you want to understand it, go watch A1.1. Okay, but for now, just know the process is called capillary action. Okay, so finally, get some questions. What is transported in xylem tissue? We know here, you can try it by yourself, the answer is going to be C water from the roots to the leaves what where does translocation of sugars such as sucrose occur in a plant stem we know that's the phloem so that's going to be here 
the outer part here, the B, because that one in here, C would be the xylem. Which structure is shown in the following image? I told you it's a dicotyledon stem, right? So there's two, monocot and dicot. Remember, this is dicot that we're learning about. Last one here, the diagram below shows the cross section of a stem. What is the structure labeled Y and one of its functions? So we know that is the xylem. The outer one here is the phloem. So the xylem, you can know it does two things, transports water and minerals up or mechanical support. So the answer here will be B. So I hope that video was useful. I know there's a bunch of stuff. It's a little bit complicated, but I hope it made sense and I'll see you in the next one.